My seventh grade summer, we went to this thing, this camp called Wild Week. Uh, I think me and Rocky Silver are the only ones that are still at this church that went to that camp, actually. There's a reason we only went one year. Uh, we won't get into that. Uh, but this camp, the first night we're there, the camp pastor gets up and he says, I am the greatest Simon Says player to ever play. He says, if anyone can beat me, and he pulls out a $100 bill and slaps it on the pulpit, and he says, this $100 bill is yours. So this camp of literally like a 1,000 kids, okay, we all get up, we're all playing Simon Says, and man, he's like an auctioneer, man, he's rattling them off, and he finally gets it down to like five or six people, okay? And he says, okay, if you're still in the, if you're still in the game, Simon Says, come on down. And so these five or six guys and girls go down to the front stage, and he's, I mean, he starts hammering them. I mean, he's going at it and going at it. He finally gets it down to two people, and then he gets it down to one. And he says, you the winner, kid? He said, yeah, I'm the winner. He said, okay, come get your $100. And as soon as the kid took the first step, he said, uh, I didn't say Simon says, you lose, go sit down. I'll tell you that story to tell you this. So many times in our lives, we're following somebody. Whether we mean to or not, we're following that person. And man, whether they're doing good or they're doing bad, man, we're with them, we're with them. And then finally, it catches up to us. And if we're not following them for the right reasons, if we're not following them as they follow Christ, eventually it's going to catch up to us. And we're going to be walking away with our head hanging low because we're following them for the wrong reasons. So tonight, guys, we're going to be talking about that very thing. The title of the sermon is called Follow Me. Guys, this is a sermon series that me and Ryan have been talking about for a couple months. And I love how this is falling, guys. It's falling as y'all are going back to school because this is such a crucial time for y'all in your lives. Man, school is starting back. Peer pressure that was there in the summertime, it was there, but man, now you're back at school and there's the Friday night parties. There's all these things that y'all have to face. And if you're not following Christ, then man, guys, that's going to lead you like that kid at that camp, walking away with their head, hanging low, because now you're even deeper than you ever thought you were. So tonight, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I, I did a, uh, an Instagram poll, um, I think it was Monday, and I just simply asked y'all the question. I said, there's no right or wrong answer here. But I said, how many of you think you're leaders and how many of you think you're followers? I think we have the stats for that. 65% um, of the people that voted said, y'all, you consider yourself a leader. And 35 considered yourself followers. Um, tonight, my goal is that you realize that 100% of you are leaders. And on the flip side of that, 100% of you are followers. Um, it's just how it happens. Now, the leader thing, this is something... Um, this, is a, this is a sermon that, guys, I got nervous for, um, for, for the main reason. Uh, obviously, any time you get to do this, man, this is a big task. God has laid something on my heart, and now it's my job to give it to you. But the other reason that this makes me nervous is because my entire life, I've been labeled something that I never asked for, and it's leader. I never asked for it. Um, and my, my senior year of high school, um, myself and three other people got voted the class leaders, like the senior superlatives. Um, I was voted one of the leaders. And guys, I never asked for that. And in all honesty, I, I don't lead the way that I need to a lot of times. Um, and so before I could ever preach this sermon to y'all, I first had to preach to the man in the mirror. And that was a good check. Um, but tonight, my goal for y'all is to, to understand that, man, 100% of you are leaders. And 100% of you are followers. When those two things align, that's when greatness happens. So tonight... We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, tonight, the first point of this, of this uh, sermon is, guys, leaders lead by private discipline. Leaders lead by private discipline. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 11, verses 1, excuse me, verses 1 through 11. Guys, this is a, this is a scripture passage that you are very familiar with. Um, this is the temptation of Jesus. This is what kicked off his three-year run, his ministry, his three-year uh, run to Calvary. This kicked it off. Let's see what the book of Matthew has to say about this. Verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on, on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Then Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and immediately angels came and began to serve him. Guys, you could honestly preach an entire sermon on just this right here, but we're going to hit it pretty quickly uh, for a second time. The first thing I want you to realize is Satan did not come to Jesus on day one of his fast. Satan did not come to Jesus at the end of week one, at the end of week two. Satan came to Jesus when he was at his weakest point. On day 40, Satan came knocking. When Jesus was the hungriest, Satan came at his doorstep. I don't know if y'all have ever done a fast. Um, in college, a couple of me, me and some of my roommates, we did a couple of fasts. Um, I never did it for food. I mean, obviously, look at me. Um, I usually did it. Uh, I usually did a water only kind of thing because I, I throw sweet tea back like it's nothing. Um, and so I would usually do a water only. Um, but, but guys, day one, it's not that bad. I mean, you're like, okay, I can handle this. But by the time you get toward the end of that fast, man, that temptation is strong. Satan came at Jesus when he was the weakest, whenever he was the hungriest, and he started tempting him. Guys, if you are ever going to lead at all in your lives, it starts with your private time with God. Jesus had 40 days along with God. He had 40 days of meditating on the scriptures, 40 days of spending time with his father. And so then when Satan came and hit him with the temptations, because of Jesus' private discipline, Jesus was able to answer Satan. And what did he answer him with? He answered him with scripture. Guys, that's why, the, that's why the Bible says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I'm not sin against you. Why? Because when Satan comes at you, hit him with scripture. The next thing we need to focus on is that at the second temptation, Satan hit Jesus with scripture. Guys, don't be fooled. Satan knows the Bible better than you ever could. Satan knows the Bible better than I ever could. He knows what happens. He's just trying to get you tricked. So Satan knows the scriptures, but Jesus turns around and hits him with some more scripture. But then the final thing in this, and this is, this is the thing, that, guys, I have read this, read this message or this passage hundreds of times. And then one day it clicked. On the final thing, Satan takes Jesus up and he shows him all the kingdoms. And he says, Jesus, you can have all of this if you'll just bow down and worship me. But guys, there was so much more that Satan was offering him. Have you ever gotten in trouble at home when you were a kid and your mom said those famous words, just wait till your dad gets home? Have you? And that pit in your stomach? Let me tell you, some of y'all are like 5'5 five, because five you never got whooped today in your life. I'm 6'4 because that man in the back wore my tail out. Okay? True story. Um, but guys, that pit in your stomach, you know that, you know that punishment's coming. You know it's coming. Jesus had six, at least 6,000 years of knowing that Calvary was coming. As soon as God put breath in Adam's lungs, Jesus knew he had an appointment with Calvary. It, there was no plan B. I had a Jehovah's Witness come to my house before I went to the academy, and we're talking. And she says, well, what do you think about God's plan B? I said, God's plan B, what are you talking about? She said, she said well, when Adam sinned, then they had to go to a plan B. I said, ma'am, what are you talking about? I said, God knew what was going to happen. Jesus loved us so much that when the Trinity got together and said, hey, we're going to make man in our own image, Genesis 126 and, 120, and Genesis 126 and 27. When they got together and said, let us make man in our own image, Jesus knew he was going to have to die for us. He loved us that much. It's not like Adam sinned and God said, oh, Jesus, audible, we got, we got to go die for him now. Jesus knew as soon as the breath was in the lungs, he would have an appointment with Calvary. And Satan has Jesus. He's now three years out from Calvary. He's gone these thousands of years. Now it's hanging over his head, literally. He's three years from it. And Satan is saying, you can have all the kingdoms in the world without the cross. You can have it all without the cross. And Jesus loved you enough, and he loved me enough, that he said, I will take the cross. Guys, you will never have public victory without first having private discipline. Uh, second point tonight, guys, and this is going to throw you for a loop. Um, leaders lead by following. Leaders lead by following. And I'm going to explain it. Um, we're going to be looking at Matthew 4, verses 18 and 19 here. This is when Jesus calls his disciples. So he's been in the desert. He's gotten tempted. Now his ministry's kicked off. Now this is where we're at in verse 18. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net to the sea since they were, since they were fishermen. 
Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, um, for this one, I'm going to let y'all see my redneck side, if that's okay. Um, so bear with me. There's, there's, there's a method to the madness here. A lot, of, a lot of people growing up, they go to the beach for vacation, right? They go to the mountains. Now, twice a year, every year, I went to the biggest party in the South. Talladega Super Speedway. Man, let me tell you, I was that guy. I loved it. I loved every second of it. And twice a year, every year, until, until senior's death, Dale senior's death, um, I would go and I would watch these cars, 2.66 mile track, everywhere the black number three went, the entire field followed him. 42 cars, nose to tail. If senior ran high, the entire field ran high. If he ran low, the entire field ran low. And then when he would lose the lead, the guy who took his place, who took the lead, would run exactly where he had been running. Why? Because you learn to lead by follow. You learn to lead by follow. Jesus had his 12 disciples. These guys literally followed him for three years. That's all they did. That's all they did. But Jesus had them, okay? So Jesus has his 12 disciples. He's training them to then lead the entire nation with his gospel. How could he ever trust them in that? Because he trusted them in the small things. They followed in the small things. Small things like finding a kid with five loaves and two fish to feed the multitudes. Small things like finding the donkey so that Jesus could ride it in on Palm Sunday. Small things like fixing the upper room for the Last Supper. Guys, if they could lead in the small things, then one day they could lead, and if they could follow in the small things, one day they could lead in the big things. Big things like Peter getting up on the day of Pentecost and preaching and thousands of people getting saved. Big things like uh, Peter and John walking into the temple gate called Beautiful, and a lame man has been there every day. He can't walk. He's been, he's been lame from birth. And this guy says, yo, can I have some money? And they said, silver or gold, we don't have. But what we have, we'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And now get up and walk. Big things like then walking into the temple, looking at the religious leaders of the day and saying, this guy that you know hasn't been able to walk his entire life, he can walk. Oh, and by the way, it's because of Jesus, whom you hung on the cross and killed. Guys, if you are too big to serve in the small things, you are too small to lead in the big things. You learn to lead by following. Cody Buck, you may not remember this conversation, but we were at Fuge Camps one year, and you had just surrendered to the ministry. And we were at, we were at Fuge Camps, and, and the camp pastor, me and him had hit it off the year before, and then he's the, he's the pastor of the next year. His name is Jason McGuffey. And me and Cody are sitting eating, eating lunch or supper. It doesn't matter which one it was, but it was one of the two. And me and Cody are sitting there talking, and Jason sees just me and him at the table, and Jason sits down. And so me and Jason start talking, and I said, hey, Jason, this is Cody Buck. He just surrendered to the ministry here recently. And Jason puts his fork down, and he looks at Cody, and he says, hey, let me give you some of the best advice that was ever given to me. He said, if you're walking into the church and there's trash in the parking lot, pick it up. He said, if there's hymnals in the pews that need to get put up, just put them up. He said, how can God ever, how can God ever trust you to serve in a big role if you're too big to serve in a small role? Guys, if you're too big to help us set up chairs on Wednesday night, if you're too big to help us get pins up after service is over with, if you're too big to do some of the little things, how can you ever expect God to trust you in the big things? Jesus had his disciples. He trusted them in the small things because they had proven true in the small things. So then when Jesus goes up and he leaves them with the Holy Spirit, he had no doubt in his mind that those 11 guys would get the job done. Guys, you learn to lead by following. Guys, this last point um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, I'll go ahead and read you the scripture, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do on this. Um, the scripture is it's simple, but guys, it has such a complex meaning. Uh, if you're in the home and it says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. If you're in other versions, it says, follow me as I follow Christ. Um, but guys, the, the last point here is, is uh, leaders lead by example. Leaders lead by example. And guys, what I, what I really want to do is I just want to have a conversation with you on this last one. Um, obviously, I can't do it, but what I would have loved to have done would have been to, to pull five guys from my life and set them up on the stage and let them talk to you. Um, five guys from my life that I've literally had lead me by example. Um, this point could honestly be point 2B, honestly. It really could. It, it follows straight off of point 2. Um, 
But these five guys, I would have loved to have them just come up here and just talk to you. But I can't do that just because of life. So what I did was I picked five guys from my life that have, have, done, have exactly done, led by example in my life. And I, I contacted them before the sermon. I said, hey guys, what I need from you is I need you to give me a statement. Just something that you would give 7th through 12th graders so that they can understand just how important it is to lead by example and how important it is that their decisions matter in everyday life. The first guy that you're going to hear from, his name is Chase Tuggle. Um, Chase, when I was a junior in high school, Chase, when I was a senior, excuse me, when I was a senior in high school, Chase was a junior at Union University. Chase was a leader at Dean Out here one year. And I had basketball camp, I had basketball games that week, and I really couldn't come to D now, but, but I, I got here just in time for the bonfire that Saturday night like we always do. And Chase was off on the side shooting basketball. And so, like any high schooler, I, I just got done playing a game, but I hadn't had enough basketball for whatever reason, and I went over there and shot with him. And we, had, we interacted for about 30 minutes. The next day was Sunday, we went to worship. Uh, he, he, he wouldn't sit by each other. We, we really didn't have much interaction. But after service was over, Chase came to me, and Chase said, Hey, Fitz, here's my number. I want you to read this passage of Scripture and then call me. That turned into every week we would meet once a week. Um, we would meet once a week for Bible study. And Chase literally walked me hand by hand, hand in hand, through my senior year of high school. And really, he honestly prepared me for my freshman year of college because he knew exactly what I was getting into. Um, and the first, the first scripture, or the first quote here is from Chase Tuggle. And this is what it says. Guys, And if you, if you know Chase, this is vintage Chase Tuggle. I'm going to read you this, and then we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about just a little bit of it, and then we're going to go to the next. It says, we are all extremely weird. We all pick our nose and look at it. We all smell our own farts. The quicker you realize that whom you try to impress with your normalcy are actually extremely weird, the more chance you will make. You have to make an impact on someone else. And it's not really that hard because someone is always watching you. Whether they're inspired by you, they want to see you fail, or they just plain curious, someone is always watching. So instead of wasting your life trying to impress, try being real. Try making an impact through your vulnerability because no one else is. Otherwise, in five years, these memories that you're making now will impress no one. And in ten years, you'll forget most of these memories. But the thing that inspires the most and lasts the longest is impact. Guys, what I want to hit on this is what he says in the, in the very final thing. Guys, there's going to be times in your life that fun is going to present itself. And I've told my Sunday school guys this a hundred times. Fun is going to present itself, whether it's 30 minutes, an hour, a day, whatever it is, it's going to present itself. And you're going to think that no one's going to know, or you're going to think that beer you're throwing back, it doesn't matter. You're going to think things that you're doing with your girlfriend or your boyfriend doesn't matter. Guys, but I promise you, I promise you, the next day's coming. The next year is coming. And guys, if you don't understand this now, guys, please understand it. Guys, the things that you decide to do with your life today are literally the foundation for who you're going to be when you're my age, when you're your parents' age, when you're your grandparents' age. And that foundation that, you have, that you're laying now is the foundation that you're going to raise your kids on. So guys, please, please know that if, you, if you're at a party, you don't have to be drinking. Guys, if you feel like you need to go to the party, then go. I went to parties in college, but I went to get my teammates home. Whenever I went, there was a thing of sweet tea in the fridge. Guys, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, the next guy that we're going to hear from is, is a guy named Chuck Morris. Uh, he, he told me one time, he said, Fitz, I am one letter away from being famous. Uh, Chuck Norris. But, uh, if you've ever heard me call you Big Cat, this is the guy. Um, when I texted him, I said, hey, yo, Big Cat, I need some help. He said, what you got, man? And I told him. He said, I absolutely have you covered. Um, coach Morris was one of my high school football coaches. He was actually the only coach that supported me in walking away from the game and just chasing basketball. Uh, I've stayed in heavy contact with Coach Morris over the years, and this is the guy that whenever he pats you on the back and asks you how your day's going, he means it. Um, he is, and he's an awesome guy, and he's an awesome leader. And this is what Coach Moore said, and I love this. He said, as a father of three girls, first let me say to, that a woman's heart should be so hidden in God that any man must seek him in order to find her. Next, be careful what you focus on. Guys, pay attention to this. Perspective is so important. How do you see things? What things do you allow your eyes to see? 
Seeing things against the backdrop of eternity is so important. You are only here for a short time. Make a difference. Whenever you walk through a cemetery and, and read the words on the tombstone, you see things that you ought to be focused on, things like faith and family. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Guys, you could preach a whole sermon on that. Um, but what I want you to hear is what he says at the very beginning of this. Um, first, let me, let me talk to the guys. Uh, guys, that girl that you're dating, or girls, that guy that you're dating, I hate to be Johnny Raincloud here, but statistics show us that if you're in a high school relationship, odds are you're not going to be married to him. Like, shocker, boom. Right, let me let you recover from that. Um, but guys, 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 the girl that you're dating, that is someone's future wife. That is someone's future mother. That is someone's daughter, someone's sister. Respect her. Respect her. Um, girls, know your worth. Know your worth. And as Coach Moore said, your heart should be so hidden in Christ that he has to go through God to get to you because it is that important. Um, and then in the end, man, when he talked about walking through walking through a cemetery and looking at the tombstones, guys, live your life in such a way that as Chase said in the previous quote, that you make an impact. Because guys, like I've told you before, if they stand over your grave and they say, man, he was a good ball player. Man, he was smart. He was funny. And that's all they say. Man, you failed. You failed miserably. But if they stand over your grave and they talk about your relationship with Christ, then the world's crying when you go out of this place, but you're rejoicing in heaven because that's what matters. This next guy is Sergeant Alfonso Newbern. Uh, I've, known, I've known Alfonso for, for pretty much my whole life. Uh, this is a tough dude. He's one, of, he's, one of our, uh, he's one of our investigators at the office. And man, this guy... Whenever he walks in a room, you know he's that guy. He, you know he's there. He's quiet, but man, he is a leader and a half. And he loves Jesus. And he, he makes sure that you know he loves Jesus. He's not going to throw Jesus down your throat, but by the way he lives his life, you know that Jesus is in the center of it. And Alfonso said this. I love this. He said, don't be afraid of failure. Leaders persist in prayer. Do not be fooled into thinking that you can do it by your own ability. As we persist in prayer, we grow in character, faith, and hope. When we live by faith, we are not to give up. Don't forget that we do everything to the glory of God. Guys, he hits home. He hits home on the first point of the message. Guys, if you're not spending time in prayer with God, then you're failing. If you're not spending time with God in Scripture, or just, guys, if you're in your car, I'm in my car eight hours a day is what I do. I drive around and then find someone to, to talk to. Um, you'll get that later. Um, Guys, if you're not just turning the radio off and just spending some time with Christ, guys, start doing it. I promise you, having the radio off in the car is, a nice, is, is nice until dispatch starts telling you to go somewhere. Um, but y'all don't have to worry about that. But guys, use that time to spend time with Christ. Guys, because as you follow Him, as you follow Him, then you lead others. But guys, it all starts in prayer. That is the foundation. And, co and not coach, and, and Alfonso knows that. This next guy, number four or five, his name is Thad Norris. Thad, I met at the, at the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy. He was one of, he was one of our instructors. And uh, he was the guy that I loved to hate, like week one through six. I mean, he was, uh, he was cocky. Um, he'd get up in your face and make you do push-ups and smile while you were doing it. Um, but then we were doing a, I was leading a Bible study one night. And Thad walked in, and I thought we were in trouble. Because I was sitting on, like, I was sitting on something you weren't supposed to sit on. We had drinks in there, weren't, had food in there, weren't supposed to have anything. It was after hours. We didn't think anyone was in there. And Thad walks in. And he goes, whoa, what do we have here? And I was like, well, we got push-ups, that's for sure. And uh, I said, we're, we're doing a Bible study. He said, that's awesome, but I have a problem. I said, what? He goes, I wasn't invited. So I said, well, come on. And he walks in, he sits down. And uh, after that, Thad comes up to me and he goes, hey, Fitz, he said, it's time to have us a baptism. He said, if anyone, if anyone gives their life to Christ, we're going to make it happen. We baptized three. Um, and, and I really got to see the other side of that. I realize why he's cocky. He's a Cardinals fan. Um, I won't hold that against him. But, uh, but, man, he's that guy that you just want to be around. He leads in everything that he does. And Thad said this. He said, first and foremost, always let God shine through your actions. Always say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yes, sir, no, sir. Please and thank you. 
People remember your manners. They equate, they equate to, to your actions. With social media these days, once it is posted, it's there forever. Employers and college, and college recruiters go back seven years on your social media to help them decide on giving you a scholarship or a job. If God is shining through your actions, this won't be a problem. Guys, please listen to what he says at the end about social media. Guys, it's the devil's playground. Social media is the devil's playground. I don't know, do y'all know who Sean Newcomb is? Um, the, the man is a pitcher for the Braves. Half of y'all claim to be Braves fans. Next lesson, we'll have a, a section online because y'all don't know who he was. Um, uh, Newcomb was one strike away from a no-hitter. He was one strike away. He lost it. The next day, the headlines were not about him almost throwing a no-hitter. The headlines were about a tweet that he tweeted when he was in high school. Guys, social media is the devil's playground. And yeah, you can be all Christian buddy-buddy on Facebook. But guys, what you're posting on Snapchat, you don't think we see it, we see it. You got me blocked from your story, I still see it. Like, it's there. Um, guys, people are looking up to you. And they're watching you lead through your social media. So what you're posting matters. What you're posting is important. Man, you could, social media could be used for so, so many good things. But man, the devil has ruined it. Guys, please, please be cognizant of what you're posting. And, and, and to play to what he said, when I, get, when I hired on for the, for the sheriff's office, I walked in and the guy looked at me and said, what's your Facebook? And I told him. And he goes and he starts digging through my Facebook with me sitting right there in front of him. Guys, it is important. They look at it. Some of them right there in front of you. This last guy, Vester Jones, um, he's actually sitting in the back. Um, he's a guy that whenever he sees you, he goes, hey, what's up, hero? Every time. Every time. He is an awesome guy. And man, he lets Christ shine through his actions and everything that he does. And what Vester said in this is incredible. He said, even when you're not aware, someone is looking up to you for, for your guidance. Trust in God, because if, if he brings you to it, he will help you through it. Don't let, don't let your past predict your future. You cannot drive forward looking in the rearview mirror. Always remember, the way you handle your misfortunes can be a blessing to someone else. With that... No, you don't need to worry about things you can't control, but instead turn them over to God and always surround yourself with positive-minded people with high goals in life. Every day is a good day. Some days are just better than others. Guys, the way that you go through your trials, guys, it matters. Guys, I look to y'all so much in the misfortunes that we've had in this youth group the past couple years. Some of y'all have led like I have never seen before, and that matters to people who are trying to go through the same thing that you're going through. Guys, the way that you lead is by example. And if you're leading by example, this is what happens. Things like this happen. Tonight, you've sat through this. Maybe you're a follower, maybe you're a leader. I hope you understand that you are 100% a follower, and I hope you understand that you're 100% a leader. But guys, tonight, you have an option. You have an option. If you're, if you're not saved here tonight, you have the opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior and to follow the greatest leader to ever lead on this planet. But even he was a follower because he followed his father in everything that he did. Now tonight, maybe you've sat through a gospel presentation so many times that you can almost quote the sinner's prayer that the preacher prays. I'm not going to do that for you. I'm going to present the gospel in the simplest way that I know how. You see, my father is sitting in the back of the room. My father is my hero. And I would guarantee you that I could take all the money in the world and put it on this stage. And if, and if you said, Jeff Fitzgerald, the only way that Zach walks out of here alive is if you die for him, he would do it in a heartbeat. Because he's my dad. That's what he does. But on the flip side of that, I can promise you all the money in the world. That if you put all the money on the stage and you said, hey, pick one of y'all out. He says, hey, Cody Buck, the only, way, the only way Cody Buck walks out of here is Jeff if you let Zach die. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Because dads don't do that. Guys, God sacrificed his own son, his only son, so that you could live. He loves you that much. You mean that much to him. Guys, you have the option. You have the opportunity. You have the privilege of making Jesus your Lord and Savior tonight if you have never done it. The other opportunity that you have tonight, guys, if you're saved in here, Guys, y'all are back in school. Man, y'all have y'all have y'all's mission field is greater than any any Brazil trip that you could take. Your mission field is greater than any mission to Lexington thing that we could ever host. Guys, you have the opportunity to lead your friends 
to the cross. You have the opportunity to, leave, to lead your friends straight into eternity. Guys, come to this altar and ask God to give you opportunities so that you can present his gospel to your friends. I firmly believe that some of y'all are being called to start Bible studies in your schools. I firmly believe that some of y'all are being called to lead in, in greater ways than we ever could. But the only way that you do that is by your private discipline. The only way that you do that is by your following. Who are you following? And then by leading by example. Because they're, they don't want to listen to me. They don't want to listen to Ron. They don't want to listen to Brother Clay. They want to listen to you because you're their friend and you know what they're going through. And you know them better than we ever could. So guys, come ask God to give you opportunities to share his love and his saving grace with your friends. Guys, tonight, I hope and pray that this message has hit home with you because I know it did with me. Guys, follow me as I follow Christ is what Paul wrote. Guys, I hope and pray that in your lives, you can, you can make that bold statement. Guys, if you can't and you're a Christian, guys, you got, you got some house cleaning to do. Because Paul wrote it, but guys, it rings true in our lives tonight.